We're in the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, she, her, and hers, and I am the Senior Partnerships Manager here at All Voices. Today, I am very excited to welcome our next guest on to the interview series, Danny Rossetti. She is the Chief Talent Officer at Buchanan, Ingersoll, and Rooney. Uh, Danny, thank you so much for being here. If you want to share a little bit about yourself for our listeners, including your pronouns and when you were younger, do you remember how exactly you answered the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Sure. Thank you so much for having me. I love talking about what I do. I love my job. Um, as you said, I am the Chief Talent Officer here at Buchanan Ingersoll and Rooney. We're a firm of about 450 attorneys and about 800 total employees. Um, before I began a career in management at a law firm, I was a practicing attorney for several years. So that helps shape my perspective and really understand the needs of the firm. Um, I have been with Buchanan for 13 years, though I will say this is my fourth title um, through lateral moves and promotions. So they, they have definitely invested in me and I have really feel like I've grown up here professionally. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and in addition to my career, I just always like to mention that I am a mom to two amazing children, um, a 14 year old and a 12 year old. So I've got the teen and tween thing going on. And sometimes work is the least stressful part of my day. Um, I thought it was a fun question. And um, you know, what did I want to be when I grew up? And this is completely honest and sincere, but might be the silliest and the most random answer that you've ever gotten on this podcast. But I wanted to be a game show host. <laughs> I I watched a lot of game shows with my grandparents when they were babysitting me when I was younger. And I just loved the energy. I thought it was competitive and it was fun. And I wanted to be on TV playing games. So I have not um, fulfilled that dream, but Chief Town Officer is a close second. I love that. Thank you for sharing a little bit about your story. And as someone who's very close to her grandmother as well, we watch a lot of Family Feud match game, uh, yep. family household. So I love that answer. Uh, you mentioned that you've been with the firm for, I think, around 13 years as mm -hmm. well and have moved around a lot in terms of roles and, and things like that. I think over the past few years, a lot of people are thinking about uh, kind of their expectations from their employer in addition to career development and authentic investment in themselves. One study found that 47% of employees reported that their stress was higher than anything they'd experienced in their career, but only 37% agreed their organization really understood what they needed both in their personal lives and with their families. How are you showing up for the full lives of employees? Yeah, it's such an important question right now. There's just, there's a lot of stress out there. We are all facing a ton of challenges, you know, in our professional and personal lives. I always felt like Buchanan was a very understanding, very, you know, comfortable, open place to work. But I will say that after going through the pandemic, you know, it was eye opening. Um, and we learned a lot about each other, right? We were home, we had moved to video calls for the first time, you could, you know, hear kids crying in the background, dogs barking, you know, spouses would walk by, um, you know, in your your vision. And in a way, it was refreshing. I mean, we got to know each other in ways that we never did before. So we're really trying to keep those lessons that you know we did. I, I was thinking about this and I thought of one of my favorite partners at the firm every time I talk to him. Doesn't matter if it's once a month or twice a week, if we have an issue together, he always asks me how I'm doing. He always asks about my personal life and it feels sincere. It doesn't feel forced or that's just something that he always does because he remembers what you know, I said, so I try to model that when I'm speaking to people and you just take a moment and find out how they're doing, you know, how is his everything going, you know, in their lives and, you know, they can share as little or as much as they want, but making sure that, you know, they have the opportunity to not just talk about work because we spend, you know, so much time together. We want to know, you know, things that are going on. It is really important 
for me to not only model, but to train people at the firm who are in supervisory types of positions to listen um, and to really have the mindset that we are employing people for the long term, not for the short term. We're not trying just to get a few years out of people or get as much work as we can and have them burn out. So in order to do that, we have to go through their ups and downs with them. So of course, you know, we have resources. Um, we have things like um, backup daycare, we have backup elder care. When people are going through a particularly challenging time, we have an employee relief fund you know, that people can apply to, that the firm contributes to you know, every year. And we have an outside vendor who does an assessment of that. So we do have you know, a, a generous parental leave. We, we do have the policies and the resources to back it up. But again, I do think the most important part and something that we've learned through the pandemic is to really just ask and listen. Absolutely. That asking, really listening for the, the answer, demonstrating that you're actively listening um, and asking that question, how are you doing, is really important. I have a couple of questions about modeling and, and training as well and what that looks like in practice. But starting off with, with that modeling behavior, everybody has a responsibility to create a place that people feel like they are empowered to do their best work, that you know, it's a great company culture. Uh, from your perspective, what is your unique role as the chief talent officer to really lead the company's uh, company culture? So at, when I started and through 2015, um, the firm had three distinct departments. We had a recruiting department, a professional development department, and a traditional HR department. Um, we did decide, and that's when I took on, you know, a role of leading, you know, all three of those groups um, and calling it and changing it to talent management. And having kind of that cohesiveness, because we meet together regularly, we plan together, we all know, you know, the different roles and how they impact. So we eliminated those silos. And it was really a positive thing. And I saw a lot of just improvement in the culture with the employee experience, because you are working with the same people from your first interview, you know, through your integration. And we have one position that is focused solely now on integration. So they stay very close to somebody and make sure that they are getting all of the you know, the right onboarding and introductions and, you know, trainings that they need. And then we have, you know, folks that are working on with you on compensation and promotion and your professional development. Um, and then, you know, traditional HR things when you need to utilize benefits, all of it is, is coming now from the talent management department. So it is a full cycle. And then, you know, at the end, if somebody is moving on, then I'm the last person that they talk to. I do their exit interview. And so, you know, I do it not for reasons of, you know, having something specific to them or their personnel file, but just to understand what their individual experience was here. And I know this is kind of like a cliche thing to say, but when I did get promoted and did become a member of the C-suite, I feel like I have the proverbial, you know, seat at the table and I have been able to influence policy and give input into important firm decisions. I, my time at the firm and being in the various roles has allowed me to really build relationships and trust with a lot of people that are here. So I get all kinds of feedback all the time, the good, the bad, the ugly, and that helps me, you know, formulate what my suggestions are going to be, you know, and how to be responsive to that and to continue to move the firm forward. I love that. I think that is so important to, to recognize and also bringing more seats to the table and helping folks mm -hmm. really achieve their career, career goals. All different kinds of feedback is important and understanding that full life cycle of the employee experience, understanding how people are feeling about, about their work, how they are outside of work. Uh, thinking about that career progression and professional development, what are the ways that uh, you and the team are investing in that progression of future leaders and beyond? 
Absolutely. So we really aim to have our people grow with us, not leave for different or better opportunities. So that starts with a culture where people feel comfortable to share either, you know, dissatisfactions, concerns that they have, or, you know, raising their hand and saying that they want to do more, they want to try something different. Um, and sometimes, you know, having those uncomfortable conversations around salaries. So we we do want that kind of open door feeling. And I think our firm um, has been exceedingly good at this. We do encourage our attorneys if they have aspirations of, you know, doing leaving for a year to do a clerkship or ultimately becoming a judge. You know, that's not something that they have to keep secret from us. They can talk to us about it. We've had people in our administrative departments who have wanted to try, you know, something completely different to move from accounting to a, a marketing position or people that want to get promoted and, you know, apply for positions that are at, you know, a level above where they are now. And we encourage them to do that. Um, we, we've got a lot of success stories where people have done that. And, you know, I am one of them. I was not shy. I was pretty vocal and persistent about raising my hand and sharing, you know, with internal supervisors and mentors that I did have, you know, aspirations of, you know, moving up in the leadership ranks and that I saw, you know, my strengths leading me that way, but, you know, I needed the firm's um, support and, you know, their ability to, you know, let me take ownership of things and, and prove myself. And they were very responsive to that. So when all of that is in place and we decide or, you know, that we can really, you know, see somebody here fulfilling their career goals internally, we have a lot of different avenues. Um, I do a quarterly manager and director leadership training. And that's on everything from, you know, how to give effective feedback during the pandemic, how to manage remotely, how to increase your own presence and your brand. So we do that um, group leadership training. And then we select individuals um, frequently and hire external coaches. And it is, um, it's great because we all are busy. So having somebody, you know, that you can really turn to that is going to give you that, you know, consistent attention, really challenge you, um, you know, push you outside of your comfort zone and, and help you develop these leadership skills and then bring them back, you know, to the firm and employ them um, has been a, a, a successful thing that we have done. Yeah, and having those multiple kind of voices, kind of those points of guidance as well during your career path when you have questions, we know that it does take take a village or your personal board of directors for folks who are kind of part of that team for for you and individuals who you mentor. What is the difference between really mentors, managers, sponsors, and coaches? Sure. So the best description that I've ever heard, the simplest of a mentor, it's an ear to listen and a brain to pick. And, you know, I like saying that mentors are there to offer guidance. They offer advice. They share their own stories. Um, many mentoring relationships happen organically, um, and that's wonderful, but sometimes they're a result of a mentoring program, you know, that has more structure. And I, I find that as much as I will encourage those organic mentoring relationships that I see being established across the firm, sometimes, especially if there's members of from underrepresented groups, do need to have that formal mentor, you know, put in place. And, you know, they, they have a resource that, you know, they can go to. Um, and sometimes it's just people request. So just in the last month, I've had one person internally and one person outside of our firm ask me if I would be their mentor. And I was flattered. I thought it was, you know, such a nice request. And I was really impressed with their moxie, you know, for just coming out and asking, hey, you know, can, I think I can learn from you or I would like to be able to talk to you about certain things. And, you know, most people are really happy to do that. So I just encourage people, if you see somebody that you're impressed with and you would like to, again, you know, have them as somebody that can listen or, you know, share advice, help you process and work through things, then, you know, go ahead and ask them. I have been fortunate when you talked about managers, I think of that as, you know, who is supervising me? 
I've been very fortunate that I would consider my supervisor a very big mentor um, in my career, but sometimes it's separate. Sometimes you have, you know, that's not the best person to mentor you. You need that outside, you know, objective opinion and not somebody to go to that you're kind of going through the daily grind with. Um, I have a close enough relationship with my supervisor where I feel like I can share mistakes. Of course, I want to impress him, but I can share mistakes and I can call and I can ask you know, for opinions and feedback on, you know, small or, or big matters. Um, I will distinguish mentoring from sponsoring. You hear a lot now in organizations about mentorship programs and sponsors and sponsorship programs. And sometimes I think people incorrectly use them interchangeably. But the biggest difference is that a sponsor is going to find an opportunity for you. Sponsors are typically really powerful people within an organization and they are going to help you get promoted. They're going to help you get work. They're gonna help you get a, a board or committee position. They're going to make introductions. They're going to use their political capital to get something done for you. So those are very special relationships. They're usually not as ongoing as a mentor who would be there you know, for an extended period of time, but they're going to help you accomplish a specific goal and they are going to put their reputation behind you to make that happen. Let's see what else you asked about um, coaches. I would distinguish a coach. And I think I mentioned that, you know, I did have um, the privilege, the opportunity to benefit from, you know, having an executive coach that the firm had hired to work with me. And a coach is somebody who's going to really help you find that motivation and those leadership skills within yourself. The coach is not going to model or tell you what to do. They're going to ask you to think about it in different ways. They're going to ask you, you know, to put yourself in somebody else's position to do things that are outside of your comfort zone because, you know, they're going to to challenge you. So, you know, working with the coach don't mean to be too cheesy, but for me was incredibly transformative in my own leadership journey. Thank you for outlining the differences between all of those different roles, your mentor, I know. manager, but it's not exclu exclusive. And I think, you know, addressing kind of what the goal of the sponsor is and, and coaches the opportunity there is really important. You mentioned earlier kind of some of the, the sessions you lead as well for internal resources. How do you effectively help out new managers and encourage managers to have that ownership mentality to create psychological safety on their team? Yeah, it's a big switch. So ascension to a management role requires a, a different mindset. Your day-to-day -day goals when you're laying them out are no longer, you know, what is best for you, but what is best for the organization. And I really believe it becomes incumbent upon you as a manager to give back, to pay it forward. And like you said, to create an environment where people feel safe, to bring their whole selves, but also to take risks and make mistakes. And you can achieve this. I found the best way is to be very relatable and I will share, you know, my own mistakes and I own them and then, you know, share the process through postmortems or through, you know, some self-reflection about, you know, how I have moved on and I've, you know, applied or sometimes, you know, how it took me, you know, two times to make that mistake. I mean, people deserve second you know, and third chances. Um, and also, you know, I find that it is helpful to be direct and encourage managers to be direct. I don't like to hear that I did something wrong from somebody else because, you know, somebody complained. Talk and speak, you know, openly to those who are you supervising and you, know, you can call them out in a way that is productive and, you know, establishing that trust and that, you know, ability to communicate, it, it's imperative that you teach managers, you know, to, to be receptive to that and to no longer, you know, just drive everything by their own performance to, to delegate, to empower. 
building that trust is so important and it takes time. It's in those micro moments, it's in big moments, it's in effective communication. Uh, we've been talking a lot about strategies and effective resourcing and training. If you fast forward, how do you think about measuring your effectiveness as an executive? Yeah, that is a tough question because of course, most workplaces have annual evaluations and I do take those seriously. The firm will solicit, um, you know, from people that I've worked with, what their feedback is, how their experience was, you know, working with me. And, you know, I will get this printout of strengths and opportunities for growth. Um, but that's not how I personally measure. Like, I, I, I welcome that feedback and I will read it and I will take it seriously. But I really feel good and feel effective when I observe organizational change on a macro level or an individual, somebody that decided to join the firm because they had a good experience through the recruiting process or maybe had other opportunities and ultimately decided to stay with Buchanan. Or when I see that people have thrived um, you know, with some of the opportunities and resources that we have presented to them or provided to them. So that's when I can feel um, effective. I, I can see, you know, those differences that I'm making. And then, you know, on the other side of things too, I am somebody that really wants to hear feedback. I'm definitely of the mindset that feedback is a gift. So you have to make sure that people know that they can share with you. I don't like when somebody starts a conversation off with, I don't mean to be critical, or, you know, I know this wasn't your fault, but, and I say, oh, no need to preface it or anything like that. I, I really, I enjoy the feedback. I want, you know, to hear it. I don't want someone to suffer in silence. You know, I want them to talk, you know, how can I be more effective? You know, what could I have done to be more effective? So I think it's, kind of through that observation and, you know, anecdotes or, you know, direct conversations I've had that I measure my own effectiveness. Yeah, it's both the qualitative and quantitative ways you think about measuring that organizational change and impact mm -hmm. on Buchanan and, and folks True. who are working there overall too. And once you receive that feedback or you're looking at something and you're like, how can I improve this? We've seen so many folks really audit the employee experience, especially over the last few years. Can you tell mm -hmm. me about uh, just one of the ways you've redesigned a system to be more equitable at the firm? Sure. And I won't take credit for this because we have a wonderful chief diversity inclusion officer, but I think that his creation of our affinity groups has been a great way to audit the firm. So we have four affinity groups, one that deals with um, underrepresented, um, racially diverse attorneys and staff. Um, women, we have LGBTQ, and we have a caregiver group. And those, anybody can join those. Um, they are, they have many different roles, but one thing that they do is act like focus groups sometimes for different initiatives. So it's a great way to audit, okay, we think we're rolling this out or, you know, or we take suggestions on things that they might feel you know, are lacking or that are unfair or are just too vague that we need more transparency around. So I think our affinity groups have been incredibly impactful in that way. And then, you know, the partnership that I have personally with the Chief Diversity Inclusion Officer includes things like having a voice in the promotions process, making sure that we are checking each other about being very intentional in our recruiting, um, you know, how we're sourcing candidates and how we are, you know, deciding on compensation. And um, we do compensation audits on a yearly basis every time compensation is set. So uh, we have some internal mechanisms to help uh, create equality. Yeah, I think those are some great examples also in collaboration with your chief diversity officer as well. Is there, mm -hmm. Danielle, anything that I didn't directly ask that you want to share with folks who are listening or underscore any key insights you hope people really bring with them after hearing our conversation today? 
Yeah, I think the theme, you know, through the conversation today, and again, thanks for having me, is just to share, um, you know, how important it is to listen. We you know, employees are not fungible units, so you know, listening and motivating and investing um, and really just caring about your people as your greatest resource um, and thinking about, you know, how are, how are they feeling? How are they going to react to that? And just, you know, creating those open, transparent and inclusive environments. I love that. I think that is a great call to action to end our conversation on. Uh, Danny, thank you so much for being on Reimagining Company Culture this afternoon. Yeah, thank you for having me. Of course. And as a reminder for folks who are listening at All Voices, we really believe in both employees and employers being seen, heard, and understood. And know it's a requirement for the business to really succeed overall. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. <laughs>